Carissimi amici, benvenuti, my dear friends, welcome once again right here in my kitchen, Nick Stellino's family kitchen. Today we are going to turn your home into your favorite restaurant with these wonderful recipes. We have shrimp with spicy mushroom sauce. And then from the region of Reggio Emilia, shrimp with parmesan cream sauce and prosciutto. So make sure you watch because this is going to be fantastic. Nick Stellino's Family Kitchen is made possible by... Funding for this program is provided by Kenmore Elite Appliances. Kenmore Elite, the proud makers of ranges, cooktops, and wall ovens for family kitchens all across America. Additional funding provided by Domino Sugar. Family means everything, and family traditions are sweeter. Domino Sugar helps you create those special memories. Pure cane, sweet memories. Domino will always be your sugar. And by BJ's Wholesale Club, exclusively featuring Rosano, ethnic Italian food products. BJ's Wholesale Clubs, where value comes to life. Additional funding is provided by Larry's Markets and Maurice LaCroix Watches. Mushrooms, and what a collection of mushrooms we have before us. What do we need these mushrooms for? Well, I'm going to show you today a wonderful dish, a spicy mushroom sauce with shrimp. But before we deal with these mushrooms, which I'll put aside over here, let's make something special actually happen with the shrimp. In this pan, which I prepare, we're going to add some extra light olive oil. Why extra light? We're going to be sauteing the shrimp, and we want to make sure that there's a lot of heat in the oil, so that when the shrimp actually hits the pan, immediately sears. Shrimp, to me, I love them. Once I had an argument with a friend, plural shrimp, is a shrimp or is a shrimp? Well, we never actually settled that, but we both know that we like it. So if you actually know, do write in and let me know because I'd be curious to know the proper usage in English. You see, in Italian we say gambero for a single one, gamberi for a plural of. This is what the shrimp, when they're fished out and after the head has uh, been taken out, what they look like. Uh, and people often say, you know, how do you actually clean the shrimp? It's, it's a very simple process. You have to get your hands dirty. You go around like this and you peel it almost as if you would peel uh, an onion, so to speak. Quite simple all the way through. This is the tricky part. A lot of people leave it at touch. I simply pull it out just like this. Let's do the same with this other shrimp. You go into the middle, right where it's at, and you start pulling out the skin. It is not as tough as you see it done actually with the lobster. Lobster, you could not do something like this, unless, of course, you're Hercules or the incredible wrestler known as Hulk Hogan. Now, he's got muscles that are unbelievable, but uh, if you're a normal person like me, uh, do not do this barehanded on a lobster. Now, you think you're done, but you're not. Unbeknownst to many people, the shrimp has right here, and I'll point it out, uh, a digestive tract that runs this whole way. We have to devein the shrimp. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut it open. And sometimes the digestive tract is full, and sometimes it's not. So you really have to go look for it. In this particular case, the shrimp, the shrimp was on a good diet and nothing did happen. So we go and we look and search for the other one. What an incredible thing you have to do. That's why a lot of people like to get the shrimp devein ahead of time. Oh, this one does have one. And this is exactly what you want to do. You want to pull this bit away. Once it's pulled away, the shrimp is now safe and good to eat. So this is a process involved in the deveining of the shrimp. Let me dispose of this uh, shrimp remnant over here in my disposable uh, bin. And let's talk about what we're going to do with the shrimps. We have in here a mixture of flour. I'm going to add some flour. By the way, this is a very simple technique that I'm about to show you, but it's very important because it really brings out an incredible flavor. To the flour, we're going to add paprika, whatever amount you like, some pepper and a good amount of salt. Then using your hand as a mixing technique, actually as a tool, your hands are the very best tool, 
You prepare it all and uh, then we take the shrimp and we actually toss it and we add it in there. Now the purpose of us doing this is that we want to coat the shrimp with the flour, but not any coating it so that it's completely dripping with it, enough to almost have a veil, so to speak. And I'll put some extra shrimps in here. Now, once you've done this process, the next thing is just as important, and that is actually shaking off the excess flour. And a lot of people are somewhat remiss about that. If you were to take the shrimp right now, and in its present form, add it to the sauteing, excuse me, to the cooking oil in the pan, the flour, the excess flour, will actually go to the bottom of the pan and really burn into the oil. This is something that we do want to avoid. So what I do at this point, and this is very simple, you just shake whatever extra flour there is, put it into the pan, shake what extra flour there is, put it into the pan and dispose of this. And we're ready now to actually cook this. Now your hands will get dirty, as they always do. That's why I always keep a nice wet towel on the set. <laughs> It's excellent for me, and it saves you a lot of little inconveniences. How hot is the uh, olive oil? Well, I can tell you, just seeing it rippling, that it's pretty much what we want it to be at. We always put a scout, an explorer shrimp. Oh yeah, it's ready to go now. One at a time. The cooking process is gonna be quite fast. Notice as I put the shrimp, I let the shrimp splash on the other side. You want to cook it until it picks up a nice, wonderful coating on one side. And I will turn it in a short while to show you exactly what the coating looks like. What we're shooting here for is to make a nice seal coat on one side, but still remember the shrimp will be somewhat raw on the inside, even after we cook it on the other side. And why is that important to us? It's important because we're looking to really finish the shrimp inside the sauce. Now let me turn them one at a time, and I want you to see exactly the coating that I was discussing with you before. You see? Look out. Now, the reason why we use the flour is because the flour aids in this process. And as it aids in this process, it, it makes it almost perfect for us. It's almost like a shield. This shield, if I can give you an impression so that you understand exactly why it's so important to us, locks in the juices. The biggest and most difficult thing for people to do with shrimp is to really cook them so that they are not overcooked and they still stay tender. This technique is wonderful. Now, remember this, we're counting this down to basically less than a minute per side. We are just about done with this. We want to take the shrimp out. Remember, it's still raw on the inside. And we're going to finish the shrimp later on in our sauce. So using a slotted spoon, we put it on a waiting dish that we have here on the side. We've lined this dish with some brown paper. This is basically a supermarket uh, bag, which I cut into a uh, square. Very useful. Why do I use this instead of paper towel? The absorbency uh, properties uh, of this particular brown paper is fantastic. Also, I must tell you that's how everybody used to do it in my family, and uh, who knows, maybe out of following up family tradition, that's why I do it, but I've never been disappointed. Another pan now, we're going to start the sauce. In this particular case, though, since we're going to be braising and sauteing many of the ingredients, we start with a wonderful extra virgin olive oil. I'm going to bring this out to temperature, and while this gets nice and hot, I want to start assembling together the other ingredients. The ingredients for the sauce, ah, uh, well. The sauce, I told you, is a spicy mushroom sauce. And the spicy mushroom sauce, of course, has the presence of mushrooms. But what mushrooms? A lot of time people get confused as to the different mushrooms that they should or should not have. These are the most common ones. White button mushrooms. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're called that because they're white. Uh, you definitely want to put something in there. So we have little baby shiitakes in here. Together with the baby shiitakes, we also have some cremini. So the cremini really is the portobello mushroom which has not grown. For those of you not aware of what a portobello mushroom is, it's a mushroom that grows to a wide, wide size, almost if I could give you an idea about this big, almost pizza style. It could actually be a single serving pizza for some people. But when they're babies, they look exactly like that. So let's go ahead and uh, slice these mushrooms into what we'd like to have. When I deal with the shiitake, I like to take the uh, stem of it off. The stem is not uh, as easy to digest, <laughs> only in the shiitake, not in the other mushroom. So we take that out, I'll go quite quickly with that, and then I will amaze you with my skillful slicing technique. As I will talk about the slicing technique, let's keep one thing in mind. Fast is good. 
You can impress a lot of other people. But too fast sometimes could actually bring certain injuries, and those are things that we definitely want to avoid. So let's make a nice quick saute of what we have in here. And uh, before I get involved with this, let's get and see if the oil is hot enough, and we'll get it started with some garlic. The garlic is nicely cut but very thick. Why? I want this to be used as a base. It will brown on the outside, still stay somewhat raw on the inside. It will finish cooking all the way through once the sauce is done. Let's see, is the oil hot enough? No, nope, not yet for my taste, so we're going to let these scouts stay in there and we'll come back to it once it gets nice and hot and we can do what we want to do. So, what's the technique in terms of slices? Some people like to do this, which is very impressive. Notice that I keep my finger behind the blade. It's quite important to make sure that your body stays whole and your finger still belongs to you. A sharp knife is very good. Another situation that people like to do is to cut this in quarters. Cutting it in quarter also gives it an interesting finish, but I like in slice, saute like this because it really brings us to where we want to go. So here we go with this. I haven't done this in a while and I still like the way I move. Wonderful. We get the garlic back in there. Now it's cooking nicely in the saute pan. It's picking up some wonderful heat. Together with the garlic at this point, what I like to do is to add a little bit of red pepper flakes for spice. You got to bring it in there. And together with the garlic, the other thing that I like to do is to actually put also the onions. I like to add the garlic first because I like for the garlic to brown slightly. When we add the onions, we'll bring them up to temperature as well, and then we'll lower the heat for some time so that they soften up. There's something wonderful about the way in which you can cook the onions. If you cook them on high heat, quick, speed, you will get the onion flavor, but you will not get the sweetness that the onions bring out when they are cooked on a lower intensity of heat. Together with the onions, we also go with some fresh parsley. Now, when you're at home, you want to do this for about five minutes, reducing the heat. Imagine that that's exactly what we're doing here at the studio. The next thing that we do is we add now our slice mushrooms. So here we go with the mixture of mushrooms. Remember that the mushroom looks like it's enormously big in size with all the slices that we have cut, but it will actually shrink once we cook it. The mushroom is made mostly out of water. It's one of the great personalities the mushroom does have. It's at this point that I like to add some of the salt, sea salt if you can, as the best flavor. A little bit of the pepper. And let's this one mix together with the rest of the ingredients. So here involved is the Stellino shuffle. You want to do this until most of the uh, water has evaporated from the mushrooms and they pick up a nice little slight, uh, how could I say, toasty look to them. It's important because a lot of the juices from the mushrooms will go to the bottom of the pan and will create what we refer to as the brown bits. Once the brown bits come into play, the next thing that we do is we deglaze it with some fine white wine. And here we are with the white wine. And as we move around into the white wine, you must make the circular motion with your spoon. What you want to do is dislodge the brown bits at the bottom of the pan as they will reincorporate into the sauce. And by reincorporating into the sauce, you bring back certain elements, the elements of flavor of the little brown bits that have stuck to the bottom of the pan. Now being part again of the sauce, it's a significant step that adds a lot of flavor. Then the next thing that you want to do, you want to add some tomato sauce and together with the tomato sauce, some chicken stock. Once you add the chicken stock as well, you want to bring this to a boil, then reduce the heat and bring it to a simmer. Simmer it for about 30 minutes. And as it will simmer, it will reduce and thicken up. How much is it going to thicken up? Well, the only way in which I can show it to you is by using one of my most incredible special effects. Many companies in Hollywood have asked me to actually license to them the special effect, and I can't because it's my invention. I must keep it to myself. That is called follow the finger. So here we are, and I say follow the finger, follow the finger. This is what we start with, but follow the finger, follow the finger, follow the finger. This is what the sauce will look like once it's completely reduced to the consistency that we want. Now we are here. Are we done? No, we are not. At this point, what we do, we do add the shrimp that we saved aside, put it into the sauce, and there is one more element that we actually need to add, and uh, that element is optional. And if you wanted to have it, it would be bacon bacon bits. Now in this particular case, I decided to leave this one without the bacon. I don't want to be assaulted by it. The bacon is an excellent thing to have, but brown bacon 
no matter what you do with it, by bringing this wonderful element of flavor in it, sometimes it might overpower the shrimp. And the reason for me doing this is sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. And this is the one time that I definitely don't feel nut. But many times when I make this dish at home, I actually do hide it. Let me switch here the pans. What I want to do is a couple more shuffling techniques, bringing all these elements together. Oh, this is beautiful. Now you want to let this cook for a few moments, stirring about. You want to reheat the shrimp, make sure that the shrimp does cook all the way through. And as it does cook all the way through, and it takes just a matter of moments, by the way, it is not a long process, just a few moments here and there, you will be totally amazed by the flavor that this one has. And one of the biggest surprises that you will have is that when you finally bite into it, the shrimp is nice, it's tender, it's moist. The moistness that we have preserved in the flash cooking technique that I just shared with you. By the way, I did not invent it. It's quite common, especially in the Chinese cuisine. It's one of those things that works absolutely perfect in this particular dish. So here we are, uh, ready to actually serve it. This, I like to serve it as an appetizer. I also like sometimes to serve it as a main dish. You be, you be the judge of what you like to do it with. And uh, this is what I like to do right on the plate and let the ingredients talk by themselves. Almost pyramiding one on top of the other and uh, let your mind wonder what would it be like to actually have a wonderful toasted garlic bread rubbed with some extra garlic just for good measure and uh, the sauce that you can pick up all the way along and as you put it on top of it you ask to yourself mmm do I have to share this with the guests at the dinner table? And the answer is yes. When you cook for your friends, the most important thing is to actually share. Otherwise, what's the point of cooking? So stay tuned, because what we're going to do, we're going to come back, we're going to show you another wonderful shrimp recipe, and you will be absolutely amazed. Ciao. Mushrooms freeze well. Slice mushrooms and place in freezer bags. Freeze for up to three months. To learn more, visit nickstellino.com. And here we are for one more recipe, but what is it? Well, let's start with the garlic first and foremost, and I'll tell you as we go along the way. Nicely cut, nice and thick together with the garlic. We want to add some uh, onions, white onions, nicely chopped. This is the base of a sauce, a very interesting sauce that we're about to make as an accompaniment to our shrimp, a variation of actually how to create an interesting shrimp dish. A little bit of red pepper flakes, a little bit more for spice. But what I'm about to introduce you to is an old recipe, mostly used for pasta, which I have somewhat uh, slightly changed. We're going to add some fresh herbs now. More often than not, other chefs like to add it at the end, but I like to add it at the beginning because the herbs will fry in the mix of the saute, and as they fry, they will give the flavor to the dish, and it's a wonderful dish indeed. Now, we're going to let this cook for a short while. We want to get the onions nice and soft. The base of the sauce that I'm going to make is a sauce which finds its roots in the region of Parma. Reggio Emilia, actually, is the Italian region. Parma is the town, and uh, it is actually a bit of a change that I made to accommodate an incredible ingredient, that is shrimp mixed with prosciutto. I see, prosciutto. And I'll show you the difference between prosciutto crotto and prosciutto crudo. Prosciutto crudo, which is what we call prosciutto here in the United States. Cotto is regular ham, and I will show you the difference, but you can see it right here. What I've done, I've added two types of prosciutto. The red one that you see in there is the regular prosciutto, as you know it, the parma. And I also put some regular ham, mix the two of them together, and uh, we're going to shuffle them, get them going. What I want to do with this early in the sauce, I want to get the flavoring that comes out when the prosciutto slightly burns on the outside, slightly toasts on the inside, and it sticks to the bottom of the pan, leaving what is commonly known as the brown bits. The sweetness of the regular ham and the saltiness of the prosciutto is a wonderful balance that we have. Right now, what we have done, we have made the onions translucent, the garlic is nicely toasted. Notice that I haven't added no salt so far, and the reason why that is because there's plenty of salt in the prosciutto itself. 
Next addition that we're going to do is a fine deglazing with some white wine. You can also use champagne or sparkling wine of any kind you like. And as we get involved, the important step, the always all important step, is to stir around like this. This stirring around has a function, a very important function that many people tend to ignore, and it is dislodging the brown bits which were created before when we were cooking with such high heat. As we dislodge the brown bits, we reincorporate them into the sauce. Is there a visual that you can get? Actually, there is. I'm going to take some of the wine here on the side. You see how much darkened the wine is now? That is because the brown bits have dissolved and they've gone once again into the liquid. By dislodging them this way, we're giving a personality to the sauce which would otherwise be lost if you were to avoid the stirring about. So the stirring about seems just a simple nothing, but it's extremely important. Next addition that we do, once the wine deglazes and reduces by at least half, we add whipping cream. and a little bit of chicken stock. We want the whipping cream to be the uh, primary ingredient in this particular sauce, so we're going to bring uh, the sauce to a boil. Once it reaches a boil, we will let the sauce simmer until it gets to the consistency that we want. But let's stop here for a moment, because I want to talk briefly about the difference between prosciutto cotto and prosciutto crudo. The best prosciutti Cotto and crudo actually do come from the region of Reggio Emilia, where the town of Parma is in. Now, this is prosciutto crudo. Crudo means uncooked. This is skewered by simply air drying it through a process that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. There is, as a matter of fact, a whole team of inspectors which have to go through some very difficult studies and exams in order to get their title and be able to judge when this prosciutto is done or not around the town of Parma, many companies that provide prosciutto for all of the world have their main factories. This is the most expensive one because it's very difficult to produce and uh, at the same time only in the Parma region you get this incredible flavor. It's produced in other parts of the world, they call it Parma, but I must tell you, first experience, nothing matches what does come from the town of Parma. Now let's look at the other one, prosciutto cotto. This is boiled ham, Italian style as well. Uh, here all out the world uh, in France, in Germany, here in the United States, in Canada, you see variations of it. It's sweeter, uh, it is not as expensive, it's often used as a great substitution for, wonderful for making sandwiches, but you do see the complete difference in terms of the color, and this color basically giving you the visual, the fact that this one has been cooked through. So let's go back to the recipe because I want to show you what happens to the sauce once the sauce properly reduces. Now we'll go back to the scenic effect, which I so willingly explained to you before, the follow the finger technique. So this is what we're starting out with. This uh, sauce is just now getting to a boil. So once it reduces to proper sauce consistency, this is what it will look like. So follow the finger, follow the finger, follow the finger, follow the finger, and here we are. This is the nice thickness that the sauce has. Let me turn the uh, pans, and what I'm going to do next, add the two other most important ingredients. One is green peas, and the other one it's a nice selection of shrimps that we cooked just as I showed you before. They're not cooked all the way through. They are cooked enough, but we're going to finish them inside the sauce. And here we go. Oh, yes. Quickly, wonderfully, mmm, this is fantastic. Just a couple of minutes, that's all that you need. You want to maintain the shrimp nice and moist on the inside. And the next addition that I do is the addition of grated Parmesan cheese. Once you add the Parmesan cheese. Here's what I want you to do. Immediately turn off the heat from underneath and let the cheese melt into the sauce. Now time has come for us to actually serve this wonderful sauce. And this is a great dish as an entree, as an appetizer. Listen, it's great food. No matter how you serve it, people will go crazy. And here we are. Oh, bet you, you never thought of a shrimp dish concocted in this fashion, put together with such harmony. Almost a masterpiece. When I tell you that what we specialize here is in giving you this great restaurant techniques that you can use at home every day, uh, we are serious. We intend to do that. And one more shrimp would be wonderful. Now, the way in which we like to serve the shrimp is quite important. Now, you can serve it in a dish just as we have it. You can put it into a tray and also provide your friend with some extra uh, garlic bread to eat it with. And there it is.
visit nickstellino.com. Dear friends, I hope I've inspired you some great ideas of recipes that you can make at your home, turn your home into your favorite restaurant. From my heart to your kitchen, ciao. Nick Stellino's Dine-In Cookbook, including a DVD of favorite recipes, is available for $29.95, plus shipping and handling. To order, please call 1-800-937-5387. Nick Stellino's Family Kitchen is made possible by... Funding for this program is provided by Kenmore Elite Appliances. Kenmore Elite, the proud makers of ranges, cooktops, and wall ovens for family kitchens all across America. Additional funding provided by Domino Sugar. Family means everything, and family traditions are sweeter. Domino Sugar helps you create those special memories. Pure cane, sweet memories. Domino will always be your sugar. And by BJ's Wholesale Club, exclusively featuring Rosano, ethnic Italian food products. BJ's Wholesale Clubs, where value comes to life. Additional funding is provided by Larry's Markets and Maurice LaCroix Watches.